Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the June Pacific Northwest Dews, Drought, and Climate Outlook webinar. Uh, this webinar is part of a bi-monthly series that's co-organized by CERC, NIDAS, the Northwest Regional Climate Hub, and the National Weather Service. My name is Megan Dalton, and I'm with the Pacific Northwest Climate Impacts Research Consortium, or CERC. CERC is a climate science to climate action team funded by NOAA's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program. Uh, CERC supports communities, policymakers, and resource managers in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and western Montana as they work to adapt to the changing climate by transforming the latest climate science and data into usable knowledge. Mm -hmm. On the agenda today, we have Britt Parker, the NIDAS Pacific Northwest Regional Coordinator, who will introduce NIDAS and the Pacific Northwest Drought Early Warning System. Then John Abbasaglu, one of our CERC researchers at the University of Idaho, will present the climate recap and current conditions. Then following that, Andrea Baer with the National Weather Service Western Region Office will present the climate outlook. And next, Bart Nyson, another of our CERC researchers at the University of Washington, will present on the hydrological data and tools in the Northwest Climate Toolbox. And finally, Ed Delgado, sorry, Ed Delgado with the National Interagency Fire Center will present on fire conditions, impacts, and outlook. And just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on drought.gov later this week. If you have questions, please use the chat box or the question box, and we'll take questions at the end or in between presentations if we have time. So with that, I'll turn it over to Britt Parker. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Megan. Uh, so my name is Britt Parker. I'm with NOAA and the National Integrated Drought Information System. I'm the Regional Drought Information Quarter, uh, Coordinator for the Pacific Northwest and the Missouri River Basin. So I wanted to take just a couple minutes to talk about NIDAS in case you're not familiar with our program and our partners. NIDAS's mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risk by providing those affected with the best available information and resources to assess the potential for drought and to better prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought. We want to improve our understanding of how and why drought affects society, the economy, and the environment to improve accessibility, dissemination, and use of early warning information. And our approach is to uh, achieve this goal um, by building the foundation of a national drought early warning system through the development of regional drought early warning systems, where networks of partners and stakeholders share information and action to help communities cope with drought. While the ultimate goal is national early warning, we recognize the impacts in early warning information differ across regions. So each DUES or drought early warning system has many of the same base ingredients, but ultimately have their own flavor to reflect the needs of their region. So the basic Components focus on observation and monitoring, prediction and forecasting, planning and preparedness, communication outreach, and interdisciplinary research and application. And again, the intent is to build capacity for better decision making. The Pacific Northwest DUES was officially launched in February 2016 after a year of scoping workshops and outlook forums to collect feedback from stakeholders in the region. The strategic plan is a roadmap for the region and can be found on drought.gov. And we consider this a living document um, so that we can be resp uh, responsive to emerging issues and new issues as well. So please mark your calendars. As Megan said, this is an ongoing webinar series. Our next webinar will be on August 27th at the same time. Registration information for these and other webinars can be found on drought.gov. And um, just to note, after today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to provide feedback and help inform the webinar series. So please take a moment to tell us what you think. And before I turn this over to our first presenter, I wanted to remind everyone of Coco Ross, the community collaborative rain, hail, and snow network. This is a unique non-for-profit community-based network of volunteers of all ages and backgrounds working together to measure and map precipitation, rain, hail, and snow, as well as condition reporting. By using low-cost measurement tools and utilizing an interactive website, the aim is to provide the highest quality data for natural resource education and research applications in all 50 states. Your data can help fill gaps in your area where weather stations don't exist. This will be applied to daily situations ranging from water resource analysis and severe storm warning to just neighbors comparing how much rain fell in their own backyards. 
On the right, figure A is the precipitation accumulation for two days in August last year with weather station data alone, and figure B includes that information as well as those data observed by Cocoa Ross observers. So you can see that observation, Cocoa Ross observers um, really do help fill in some of the gaps and help us better understand patterns of rainfall. If you'd like to get involved and become a volunteer, you can learn more at cocoaross.org or you can contact your state coordinator and I'll cut and paste their contact information into the chat box. And with that, um, I will turn it over to John. I have to peek with my neighbors to see how much precipitation I get. Um, my job here is to provide a little bit of a play-by-play -play in terms of what's transpired uh, this spring and over the first couple weeks of climatological summer. That has basically led to our current uh, drought situation that we can see here depicted on the right. And we have seen drought across parts of the northwestern U.S. Um, across parts of Western Washington, a little bit of Southern Idaho, basically all of Oregon, save for the sort of north, north northeastern portion. And then a little bit of drought making a cameo appearance in the Idaho, Northern Idaho Panhandle in um, also extreme Northwestern uh, Montana. Now we can contrast this actually to a year ago at this time, and that is, uh, that is not a blank map on the, on the left. That is actually the, uh, this, the actual complete lack of drought at this time last year. Now, if you remember anything about last summer, the last thing you'll actually think about is how drought-free it was. We probably can actually smell last summer. <laughs> probably not a summer that we necessarily thought would be drought-free, um, or it's not necessarily a drought-free uh, drought condition. And that just gets to the point that drought can change fairly rapidly, and the different flavors of drought can, can change actually quite rapidly over time. So I'll talk a little bit about how we got here, um, and I'll first start by contextualizing the water year precipitation. This is October through May, um, and this is for the West Wide Drought Tracker. And we did have a La Nina in place this uh, winter, a little bit of a different La Nina in that we, we saw certainly a north-south dipole in precipitation, but that was shifted even further north. And the result is, is that we have seen this sort of north-south gradient in precipitation across the northwest with basically Oregon and Southern Idaho being a little bit below normal, and then you can see above normal conditions across much of Washington, um, Idaho, and, and also Montana. And there's actually a few places in Western Montana near Helena and Butte that are, that are sort of at record wettest conditions uh, since 1895. So a little bit of the, um, the, 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 the winners and losers of precipitation thus far. Um, and what Sort of resembled La Nina was that we did have a sort of a late comeback. We had a lot of precipitation, cool temperatures in February and May, and that has certainly alleviated some of the drought concerns, um, but it was a little too little too late across Oregon in terms of drought. Moving on to this past spring, so climatological spring, March through May. Um, it turns out that actually uh, March was cooler than normal, but uh, May was quite warm across the Northwest. And when you look at March, April, May together, basically it was above normal across the entire Northwest. Um, May was particularly warm. May was actually the warmest month on record for the continental United States as well. Uh, precipitation was a really interesting picture though. And if you look at the precipitation rankings on the right-hand side here, you'll see a lot of green. But what's really interesting about this is if you look at basically the Cascades, you see that from the Cascades to the Pacific, it was you know, either normal or drier than normal. And um, the reason behind that was actually tied to a rather bizarre circulation pattern that showed up particularly in May. And I wanted to highlight this by just showing a sort of a time series here. This is accumulated precipitation. This is for the Seattle to Tacoma International Airport. So you can read this by looking at the data on the x-axis and then the accumulated precipitation on the y-axis. 
Um, the, the data for 2018 is shown in black. The sort of the, the yellow line shows our average and the individual lines show individual years. And what you, when, you, when you look at Seattle, what you actually see is that they really haven't re received much precipitation since mid-April. And May was incredibly dry. And you see similar patterns across much of the, much of the cities and locations um, west of the Cascade Crest. So what's behind that? Um, well, how, how can you actually get wet conditions over the interior, but dry conditions from the Cascade to the coast? And we typically think of, you know, weather systems being progressive. In other words, they move from west to east across the Pacific. They dump rain and the, they dump rain and precipitation along the Cascades. You get the orographic enhancement. You get the sort of the, um, the rain shadow effect. Um, and that really didn't happen in May. And climatologically, this is what we expect um, in May. We usually see a jet stream depicted by the colors here that goes across the Pacific, heads into the Pacific Northwest, and brings through, you know, occasional rain systems. If I contrast that to the actual winds, and these are 300 millibar winds, so up in the upper portion of the troposphere. So this is what we expect on average. Here's what we actually had in May. Um, and what you see here is actually that the jet stream was shifted much further north um, and that you see this sort of uh, hole, more or less, in terms of wind patterns. It was uh, relatively calm across the northwest. Um, and what happened is that we had a series, a parade, a gaggle, whatever you want to call it, of cutoff lows, basically to part southward of the jet stream, make their way over the interior west in Great Basin, and that brought about persistent precipitation whereby the sort of the windward, the typical windward places along the, the cascade to the coast didn't receive precipitation, but in the interior they did. May was also a really warm, um, really warm month. And one of the climate impacts that I'll highlight here is the great snow melt melt out that we saw. Um, and so we had a pretty good snowpack built up, specifically across um, northwestern Montana, across northern portions of Washington State, right, due to the relatively cool and wet, um, you know, uh, February, March. And then we had a really, really warm May. And so this is from the climate toolbox. You'll hear more about this from BART later on. But this was basically our snowpack percentiles on um, on May 1st, so well above normal, it's depicted by the blue colors there. Um, certainly below normal across the Oregon Cascade or Oregon Cascades and parts of Southern Idaho that that fits with our drought depiction. And this is what this is what the snowpack looked like on um, uh, the first of June. And so what we saw was that we had really really high snowpack values. Those were basically um, neutralized. We went to very low. We went to relatively normal snowpack, which is low in Montana and also across much of Washington state. And that brought about really impressive um, snow melt rates. And you might ask how, how impressive were those? How impressive was that snow melt? Well, one way to actually contextualize that is to look at the amount of snow that was actually lost between a period. And here I just look at April 25th and May 25th. And I can compare what we typically see in terms of the sort of melt-out rate versus what we got in 2018. And basically, the story is that about twice as much snow melted out as normal. And so that led to some really high flows. In fact, we saw uh, record crests um, in, in a few river systems, the highest flows in four years in the Clark Fork, um, up, uh, just, up of, well, just up of Missoula, Montana. One more thing I wanted to highlight here um, before summarizing is that we've also been developing through the, uh, the, the CERC uh, and, and NIDAS funded Northwest Climate Toolbox. We've, we've been developing a tool called the US Water Watcher. And this is basically a tool that allows you to, to look at a number of um, drought metrics. And so we've computed a number of drought metrics, a number of different flavors of drought, and you can actually compare current conditions across the range of, of possible drought impacts. And so I'm just highlighting here um, precipitation percentiles or rankings, reference evapotranspiration percentiles or rankings over the last 60 days, 
clearly depicting sort of the dry conditions west of the Cascades. Um, and then also, we also have brought in point-based observations. So you can look at stream flow and well below normal stream flow, again, corresponding to areas that we're seeing drought sort of creep up over the last, uh, over the last month or so. Uh, reservoir levels overall look fairly good, except in Oregon. Oregon has not really caught much of a break so far this year. So to summarize here, um, our current northwest drought signature is one where we basically have this north-south precipitation dipole in winter, followed by a little bit of an east-west dipole in spring, corresponding or coinciding with a relatively warm spring that has allowed for droughts to uh, creep up and emerge and be prevalent across much of Oregon. Um, somewhat fortunate is that we have had this sort of series of cutoff or closed lows across the interior, bringing fairly frequent precipitation. That has allowed for relatively decent moisture values. Um, that has kept the interior relatively, relatively wet, and that might be an important feature that we'll hear more about from Ed. Um, and then my last piece here is that we do have drought currently in the Northwest. Um, and really the bottom line is for the summer, it's all about the position, development, and persistence of the Western Ridge. So we'll look forward to what happens on that. All right, thanks, John. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker, Andrea Baer. Okay, let me... Oh, well, it helps to start at the beginning, doesn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, today about the climate and drought outlooks from NOAA and also the possibility, as um, some of you might have heard, of El Nino developing for the fall. So we'll start out with a summary slide, uh, just to give you an idea of what we're gonna be talking about. But um, the Climate Prediction Center issued an El Nino watch earlier this month. That just means that conditions are favorable for El Nino to develop uh, as the year starts to progress and, and we move into fall. Right now we are at ENSO neutral conditions, meaning neither La Nina or El Nino. Um, but I'll show you a little bit later how some of the forecasts have changed in favor of El Nino to develop. So a quick look back at where we've been. This is a look back about the last 13 years. And you can see these are uh, the seasons up here uh, at the top. So you can see the different seasons. So for example, um, the March, April, May season this year in 2018, uh, is basically when the current La Nina that we had ended because it went under the threshold of the negative 0 0.5. So what I wanted to show you here is basically we've had um, quite a strong El Nino uh, from 2015 to 2016 and then moving into two years on the weaker side of La Nina and then possibly moving back into El Nino again this fall. This is the <clears throat> a current, <clears throat> excuse me, I do have a bit of a summer cold, so I apologize for my voice uh, in advance here. Um, but you can go back and look at our La Nina event over the winter and into the spring. And as we're moving into June, you can start to see, things are still neutral, but you can start to see um, those sea surface temperature anomalies warming up along uh, the equator. And, um, so this is about the date line and um, Cabo San Lucas is right in here. So it kind of gives you an idea along the equator of, of where, um, where I'm looking right there. Um, looking at the recent sea surface temperature depart departures on a weekly basis, this is just weekly, but the area that we look for is called this Nino 3.4 area and it's highlighted with this bolded box. So we're looking at sea surface temperatures along the equator in that area. And what we're seeing right now for this week is we're at zero, positive 0 0.4. And as we move into um, where we're declaring El Nino, you'll start to see that 
if that happens, become um, 0 0.5 or above. Now, I do want to caution you, this is weekly, and those, um, whether or not we are in an El Nino event or not, will be determined on monthly values because you do get quite a bit of variation as you're looking at these on a weekly basis. But you can see in this Nino 3.4 region, again, here's the La Nina that we had, and then starting to, um, to rise on, uh, on the positive side there uh, as we enter June. And here's another look um, during the last four weeks where we've been. These are the departures from normal in the tropical Pacific. And again, things running fairly neutral to a little bit above normal and then below normal along the coast of South America. So that is where we're currently at. One thing to note though is the, um, the subsurface. So from about the surface of the ocean down to about 300 meters have warmed pretty significantly the last few months through this spring. And May 2018, the subsurface heat content was the sixth highest that it's been since 1979. So, um, so fairly warm, not, you know, super impressive, but fairly warm. And um, this is a little bit complicated, but stay with me here. Um, so what's causing that warming is we've had two um, very large oceanic waves we call Kelvin waves, and one was initiated or started um, in February and moved across the Pacific Basin, and basically it was pushing those warm waters that were in the West Pacific towards closer to the East Pacific, so displacing that, the warm and cold, and, um, and then this happened again in May, and um, just um, moved through the Pacific Basin through June here. So that's basically giving the forecasters more confidence. Um, it's often an early indicator when you see those Kelvin waves, those large oceanic waves, that El Nino is on its way or starting to develop. So that is one key thing that, that they look for when determining that. Looking at the forecast now, this was updated on the 14th of June, and this is um, in combination with our Climate Prediction Center and the International uh, Research Institute. And looking at this graphic, um, looking at the season for um, May, June, and July, we're, we're definitely very neutral, um, but that starts to uh, move into El Nino territory, so the probability of El Nino developing becomes more likely as we get into, uh, let's see, there's my cursor, the August, September, October time frame. And then moving on up to about 65% probability or so um, for the December, January, and February season. So basically what you're seeing here is El Nino is starting to look like it's more favored to be um, the outcome for the fall. Uh, we still have a, a chance, about a 30% chance in the winter of things staying neutral, but really um, La Nina should be a, a story of the past um, is what this should um, scream out at, at everybody. And another thing that's giving the forecasters with quite a bit of confidence is both um, the dynamical tools that they use and the statistical tools that they use have really come into a lot better agreement now that we've moved out of the spring time frame of the year when the models have a lot more noise in them. So they're feeling much more confident as we move away from the spring and into summer with what the models are indicating. And so um, the models, both types are, are definitely looking more El Nino-like uh, for um, starting in this August, September, October time frame. So again, just a bit more evidence that that the scientists are looking at uh, to make the forecasts. Um, so moving on to our outlooks for, I did two here, so for July, August, and September. Um, and uh, we'll start with seasonal temperatures here. And really for much of the whole country, um, the outlooks are favoring above normal temperatures for that season, but um, strongly favoring that up in the Pacific Northwest. So they're a bit more confident about that, um, which and me also means that bullseye is darker up there. So the, they're, they're more confident up there that the, there will be a shift in warmer or above normal temperatures for the Pacific Northwest. And then as we move into um, 
the potential for um, El Nino, and El Nino tends to show uh, more impacts in, in the later fall and the winter. Um, so I chose the November, December, January season, and still favoring above normal temperatures for, um, for the Pacific Northwest, um, not as strongly, but, um, but still favoring above normal temperatures up there, which is typical for uh, El Nino in the Pacific Northwest. And then as we move into the precipitation outlooks, um, so for July, August, and September of this year, um, the Climate Prediction Center is favoring um, conditions more on the drier side for, um, for the upcoming season here. I know that's, um, that's not exactly what folks want to hear. Um, but, uh, and then also as we move into um, the um, late fall, early winter season, expecting drier than um, normal conditions or um, favoring that, I should say, favoring those conditions as we move into, um, into the latter part of the year. And then looking at the seasonal drought outlook, so this was released on June 21st and it's, um, it's valid for um, June, July, and August. Um, and basically, as you can see for um, the eastern portion of Oregon, um, they're continuing the um, drought up there. That's, that's their thinking at this point in time. Um, not a lot mentioned about the western um, side of, of um, Oregon and Washington, but right now uh, I think the, the more confident side is that it will persist for the eastern side of Oregon. And with that, I will um, just call your attention to this is where you can go and get the latest on the outlooks. And then um, our Climate Prediction Center um, twice a month puts out an ENSO blog. And it's um, a, a pretty easy to understand, a lot easier, I think, sometimes in the forecast. So um, check that out a couple times a month and see how this um, event is progressing. And with that, I will pass it back to, um, to you guys, Britt. All right, thank you, Andrea. We'll move right along to our next speaker, Bart Nyson, at the University of Washington. All right, um, thank you. So I'm Bart Nyson, I'm at the University of Washington, and I'm also a surf researcher, and I do hydrology, so I'll be talking about hydrological data and tools on the Northwest Climate Toolbox. And John also already mentioned some of this, so I'll go into a little bit more detail about what the tools actually show and what you can explore yourself. There we go. All right, so this is the picture that John already showed where last year at this time, there was no sign of drought in the Pacific Northwest. And right now we have kind of this dipole uh, between um, the east side and the west side of the Cascades with drought patterns in uh, central Oregon. We look back two years ago Oh, sorry, three years ago in June 2015, uh, the, the picture was obviously very different, right? The entire Pacific Northwest was in drought with a, a D3 extreme drought in um, South Central uh, Oregon and drought colors all over the Pacific Northwest. And in that case, it really was warm temperatures during much of the spring that had caused that drought. And the pattern this time is a little bit different. It was also warmer during the spring but it was specifically um, not a lot of precipitation on the west side uh, during this spring. All right, so what I'll be talking about are the tools uh, that are available for looking at hydrological information within the Northwest Climate Toolbox. And the Northwest Climate Toolbox is basically uh, sponsored by NIDIS and developed largely by uh, John Abotsablu and Catherine Hagewish at the University of Idaho and then also with some information, hydrological information uh, from my team at the University of Washington. So if you go to the Northwest Climate Toolbox and the, uh, the address is shown uh, up on the right-hand side, it's just climatetoolbox.org. There's a whole list of available tools. You can also, there's a menu for looking at data, climate currents, and so on. But I'll be looking at two, two tools two tools today. I'll be looking at the Climate Mapper, which basically gives you an overview of hydrological and, and climate conditions in the Pacific Northwest. It actually also has fire information and so on in it. And the other one is one that John already mentioned briefly, which is this U.S. Water Watcher, 
which Catherine Hideaway has put together over the last few months, and really which, like, which allows you to kind of delve into some of the underlying data sets and compare uh, drug conditions that, that are present or not in these various data sets. All right, so we'll start with the climate mapper. So if you go, go to the climate mapper, uh, if you look on the right-hand side, there's basically you can select your data sources and then which variables, variables you want to look at. And so, for example, for these data sources, uh, you can look at recent and past conditions, climate, hydrology. There's some agriculture and climate products uh, that, that are calculated, as well as some fire danger data. There's some forecasted conditions on weather and climate. And then there's actually also some climate projections that are displayed within this uh, climate toolbox. And again, you have the same categories as for the recent and past conditions. Here, I'll basically be focusing on the hydrology tools. So if you select hydrology, then you basically have an option to select from a number of different hydrological variables. And I'll say a little bit later how the hydrological data sets are actually produced. But so you can basically select from snow water equivalent, uh, soil moisture, total moisture, which is simply the, the sum of soil moisture and snow, uh, and total runoff. And all this information is displayed as a percentile. So basically we say how the current date compares to the past. Rather than give you an absolute number, we say it's wetter than it normally was for this day in the past, or it's drier than it normally was for this day in the past. Um, and so these are these four hydrological products, and these are the ones from uh, 623, so that was uh, uh, Saturday. Basically, the tool is updated every day. And so on the upper right, left-hand side, we have snow water equivalent as a percentile. And obviously, you know, we're towards the end of June, so most of the snow had disappeared. Uh, on, the, on the bottom left, um, we have soil moisture percentile. And then on, in the middle panel, we have total moisture, which is the sum of the two. And right now, that looks pretty much like the soil moisture, right? But in the middle of the winter, you can actually have cases where soil moisture percentile is low snow is high and your total moisture percentile would still be high. Then the panel entirely on the right is basically the total runoff percentile. So for every location, how much stream flow or how much uh, runoff is being produced. And that's averaged in this case or, or, or aggregated over the last seven days. And actually within the tool, you can select the time period over which you want to aggregate. You can aggregate over seven days, 15 days, 30 days. 90 days and so on. Uh, for some of those, you can go back all the way to the start of the current water year on October 1. All right, so the percentile calculations for this tool are actually based on the period since 1979. And they show how the current date of period compares to the same day of year during that period. Right, so how, basically here you can see that uh, Western Washington and Western Oregon are much drier uh, than, than normal uh, for this time of June. All right, so how are we actually producing these hydrological data sets in this case? Well, we actually, have, John's group at the University of Idaho produces these meteorological data from a number of different sources, patches those together, normalizes them so that we can actually compare them um, historically. And then we at the University of Washington take that as input to a hydro hydrologic model. And in this case, right now it's big, but that's kind of not all that important. We could use different hydrological models as well, and that's our intention in the future. We run these models, and so we run them every day with the incremental new data that John's group produces, and then the output from those models is obviously hydrological variables, which we then post-process to percentiles, and we report those back onto the climate use toolbox as a spatial field. Um, so the nice part of this is that the climate and hydrological information on the climate toolbox are actually internally consistent. And so what you see here on the upper left-hand side is the total precipitation anomaly, so the departure from the long-term mean, uh, aggregated over the last 60 days. So this is the period from April 25th through June 23rd. And it basically shows you what John is already talking about, that the west side has been very dry uh, in Idaho, and Montana had actually has been quite a bit wetter, and Oregon has kind of been dry overall in general. And then in the bottom left, it actually shows that it's been much warmer than, than uh, 
normal. It's also an anomaly, it's a temperature anomaly for the mean daily temperature for the last 60 days. And it basically shows that it's been two to four degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. And so the effect of that over the Pacific Northwest has been this dry pattern, uh, low total moisture percentile over the western part of the basin, and this high uh, percentile over the over the eastern part of the basin, which basically, basically comes from precipitation during that period, but a lot of it also comes from snow melt, this rapid disappearance of the snowpack that John already talked about. Okay, so the other tool, so that's the climate mapper. There's actually a whole whole uh, assortment of different fields that you can analyze in this. You can actually click around in it and you can get point values. Uh, there's actually ways to, to extract time series from the tool and so on. But the other part I wanted to demonstrate was this U.S. Water Watcher uh, tool that Catherine Hagwage has put together. And so this is a view of the U.S. Water Watcher. Basically what you can do is on the upper left-hand corner, you can basically set uh, the location. And obviously that's from the University of Washington, so I selected Seattle uh, to start with. And then what you can do for each of those four panels on the left-hand side, if you click that cog that's shown on the uh, upper right-hand side of each of the panels, you can actually select from a whole series of different data sets to display in each of these four panels. The panel on the upper right-hand side always shows the uh, drought classification from the U.S. Drought Monitor. And on the bottom right-hand side, it actually shows a summary for the location that you selected of all the tools uh, that are shown. So from the five tools that you've shown, it shows basically what the, what the water condition is for that site. So if you look at Seattle, the tools that I selected in this case was precipitation for the current water year. So this is aggregated from the start of the year. On the top right hand side is the total runoff for the last seven days produced by our hydrologic model. On the bottom uh, left side, I have the total soil, total moisture, so that's uh, soil moisture and snow water equivalent uh, from yesterday, and I made this presentation yesterday, so it's Saturday. Um, and then on the bottom right-hand side, it's actually, or the, I would just say the middle uh, bottom, it's actually streamed from, from the last seven days from uh, USGS gauge locations. And it's also, they're all color coded kind of by the same colors, and the, the explanation is along the top. And in this case, the summary on the uh, bottom bottom right, so drought wet summary for the location of Seattle is basically that it's neutral everywhere, right? And um, that's probably about right uh, for Seattle. But as I said, you can actually select, when you click on one of those cards, you can actually select from a large number of different variables. And so it's a really nice way to actually dive into these data sets and try to explain why the patterns that you see hydrologically, how they would have come about. Uh, there's, a, there's a, a mix of observed uh, data and model data. And actually the other selection that you can do is kind of select the aggregation period uh, for each of the variables. So for example, in this case on the uh, top left side, it, the precipitation starts for the current water year, whereas the stream flow on the right hand on the middle two panels is for the last seven days. Uh, you can pick up these different locations. So this is one in eastern Washington. Uh, this is a Nazi part in the Idaho border. And this is actually an area that is abnormally wet. It's in the U.S. drought monitor on the top uh, right-hand side. It says neutral or wet. All the other locations basically say it's moderate to abnormal wet. And on the right, bottom right-hand side, you have a nice summary of these three. Now, of course, I showed two locations here where all the panels kind of agree. Uh, this is one where it's all dry in eastern uh, eastern Oregon. Uh, sorry, in uh, western Oregon, uh, drought ranges from moderate dry to abnormal dry. And again, the summary shows that. And then here we have another slide in central Oregon, where basically, if we look at the precipitation aggregated for the current water year, it's neutral, so it's maybe a little drier than normal, given the yellow colors in the surrounding areas. But it's about normal. Uh, the total moisture in our monitor and soil moisture is kind of an aggregated output over a large period of time, right? The soil kind of imparts memory to the whole system. It says it's normally dry, but then our total runoff on the middle uh, upper panel says it's moderately wet. 
the stream flow on the bottom says it's just to be a drought. So here's much more of a mix of signals. Uh, and you can actually delve into this a little bit why that would be happening, right? In our model, we're basically saying that total runoff for the last seven days is higher than normal. But the precipitation that we're showing on the top left panel since the current water year. So if I say change the aggregation period for this um, precipitation, and basically look at precipitation for the last 15 days, it actually turns out that Central Oregon actually got quite a bit of precipitation, or compared to historic at least, uh, over the last seven days. And that's kind of what's being expressed in that total runoff in the upper middle panel. The actual streams apparently haven't responded quite as fast, and also our soil moisture is still kind of lacking with it, but some of the streams actually, in our model at least, are picking up, and that matches some of the precipitation we're seeing. So all I wanted to demonstrate here is kind of like the ability to use the climate toolbox to kind of delve a little bit deeper in the hydrologic and climate conditions that we're seeing uh, around the Pacific Northwest. And so this is the web link, and um, with that, I'll pass it back to the uh, organizers. All right, thank you, Brett. Uh, let's, let's move right on to Ed Delgado. Okay, <clears throat> let me get my PowerPoint started. Does everybody see that? Yep, we see it. Okay, excellent. All right, so I'm Ed Delgado. I'm the National Predictive Services Program Manager at uh, the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho, and I'm going to present uh, what our current outlook is for the 2018 fire season. I'm going to try to focus uh, my attention on the Northwest, since that's what this call is about, but I'll probably be talking about some other areas that uh, will have an, uh, an effect on what goes on up in the Northwest as well. So to start out, I wanted to start out and just give you a perspective of fire seasons over roughly the last uh, 25 years. The red line is uh, the number of acres burned uh, each year. Uh, and you can see a very, very clear trend upward from year to year over the last 25 years. Uh, but if you look at the total number of fires in the yellow, you can see uh, a slight downward trend. So we're what this suggests to us is that we're seeing uh, larger fires every year, uh, burning more and more acres. Uh, part of that is due to the climate, uh, climate change, uh, the decades of fire policy of trying to put every fire out before 10 a.m. Um, part of it is related to uh, whatever management strategy on a particular fire is. And uh, so there, there's a whole combination of factors there that contribute to that. Uh, and it's, it's very easy to, to uh, come to some, some conclusions that don't consider all the facts. So I just wanted to put that into perspective. And that plays into uh, how we determine our forecast uh, each year and each season. So before we can figure out what's going to happen uh, in the next two to three months, we have to know where we are now and how we got there. And several people, some folks, uh, John uh, has already shown you some of this information. So I'm sorry if it's uh, repetitious, but these are just some of the things that we look at as we as we try to determine the fire season. Uh, with fire, there's a lot. There's a lot. Uh, it's a lot of timing uh, with regard to precipitation when things dry out, when the snowpack goes away. And uh, that, that really plays into the fire season and changes quite rapidly um, because for fires, you have to have vegetation and vegetation responds to the weather and climate conditions and changes in those can, make, can have uh, sudden and dramatic changes to the vegetation. And so our, our forecasts are uh, can can sometimes be off, and I'll I'll get into that a little bit more in just a moment. What happened with us last year? But looking at this stuff here, you can see pretty much uh, echoes what's already been said. Uh, pretty dry across uh, the the western parts of Oregon and Washington. Uh, as you get farther into the interior toward the Northern Rockies, we had a lot more precipitation. Pretty much at all the time scales I'm showing here. And if I had the water a year, you'd see. Uh, pretty much the same thing. Northern Rockies, uh, Montana, parts of Idaho, uh, fairly wet, good snowpack this year. But other parts of the of the west, northwest, particularly Oregon, uh, southwestern Idaho, 
and parts of the interior of, of Washington were fairly dry. And that, that has a, a, a huge, it's a huge determining factor on uh, what we're expecting for the fire season. But one thing I want to note, the last seven days, you can see quite a bit of, of, of precipitation over Eastern Oregon. And it's very easy to look at that and say, oh, well, that's, that's, gonna, that's gonna mitigate a lot of the fire season problems. Uh, and, and it would be easy to make that, that assumption. However, those are, uh, that part of the state is uh, rangeland. And uh, these are desert ecosystems that respond very, very rapidly to precipitation. Vegetation takes advantage of what, what little rainfall it gets and grows very quickly. And so what we will see over the next week or two is another uh, fairly sizable flush of, of grasses in that part of the state. Uh, and grasses oftentimes become fire problems for us. So we'll be monitoring that over the next couple of weeks to see what kind of fuels we end up with there uh, and try to time when they're going to dry out and be available for fire. So again, just one of the many things that we have to think about when we look at, uh, at the precipitation and how it's going to affect fire. Uh, looking at snowpack, uh, I, I went back to May uh, to, to give you a better idea of where we stood with, in relation to uh, what happened last year. You see last year, the one on the left, uh, quite a bit of snow across most of the Western United States. Uh, everybody was above normal, uh, except for a few isolated areas. Uh, and the snowpack even into late May was still really, really good. We had a cool spring, the snow didn't melt very fast, and there was just a lot of water uh, locked up in the mountains last year going into uh, the late spring and early summer. If you look a year ahead to this year, May 22nd, quite a different story. Uh, still looking good in the far northern Rockies and northern Cascades, uh, but everywhere else, uh, a lot of the interior and southern parts of the west were, were snow pretty much snow free by the end of May. Um, and, and that's a very important thing for us to consider because not only does that allow fuels to dry, uh, but they dry earlier in the year and the potential for uh, earlier start to fire season is there. And we have a longer period where uh, vegetation doesn't have water to, to uh, benefit from and it begins to stress a lot of the vegetation, especially the larger vegetation like the forest, the timber areas. So a, another factor that we have to take into account as we look into this. And also notice uh, uh, that southern, uh, that western and central, south central Oregon area and northern Nevada, those are areas that uh, potentially have a lot of, a lot of grasses and any precipitation that they get there, uh, the vegetation responds very quickly. And we saw that in the last week. So the, again, these are things that we're trying to balance in total to understand, uh, get an idea of where our fire season is going to go. Now, as I look at this, as I present this to you, uh, I wanted to point out last year going into this time of year, we were fairly confident that that moisture was going to basically keep fire season from happening across most of the Northwestern United States. A lot of moisture there, vegetation was green, and even going into late June, we still had a lot of moisture locked up in those mountains. Uh, and we were feeling pretty confident it was gonna be a rather slow fire season. For those of you in the Northwest uh, that had any exposure to last year's fire season know that that's not exactly what happened. Uh, what ended up happening was the huge heat wave that we had in July, uh, which rapidly uh, uh, de uh, depleted a lot of that moisture, but more importantly, it, uh, the high temperatures that we experienced had a huge effect on the vegetation, essentially causing it to shut down and go dormant early, despite the fact that there was still moisture available. Uh, and that couple, couple that with uh, a lot of uh, lightning events that we had in mid and late July, uh, we had a lot of ignitions in a very short amount of time, uh, and we were off to the races for fire season with a lot of fire on the landscape all at once. This year, we're being a little more cautious. Uh, we know the snowpack is not quite as good as it was last year, uh, but we have had a fairly wet spring in parts of the Northern Rockies. 
Uh, now it's just a matter of waiting to see what kind of pattern develops this year, what kind of heat uh, we're going to have to dissipate some of that moisture. Uh, and that's going to be uh, uh, largely what's going to drive our fire season this year. So just quickly looking through some other things that we consider. Notice the snow, uh, soil moisture rankings uh, in the upper left, uh, still in the upper, uh, the upper uh, percentile areas across the northern Rockies. Uh, and just a little bit over into eastern Washington and, and northeastern uh, Oregon. Uh, and then you've got that dry area across the western parts of Washington, Oregon, and across up through the Great Basin. Uh, if you look at the veg dry, very similar conditions showing up there. Uh, nothing really new to, to notice there. But one thing we are monitoring is that, that really dry area that runs up from Arizona uh, into Utah. Uh, that's an area that we, uh, this time of year, we often have a lot of fire. So far, we haven't. Uh, as John pointed out at the beginning, we were in, a, in, a, in an unusual pattern this year where we had a lot of these closed lows that came across the southwestern uh, in United States into the, into the interior. And that uh, basically kept conditions uh, relatively uh, quiet down there. We had periods where we would get some fire activity but then we would get another closed low that would bring higher humidities, maybe some precipitation, but cooler temperatures as well. And that helped reduce some of the risk there, at least as far as ignitions that uh, could have taken off if we'd gotten uh, a significant number of them on the fuel bed that we had down there. Uh, now we're starting to see a, a hint that the monsoon is gonna kick in probably in a couple of weeks through that southwestern part of the United States. And that's important because that moisture moving up through the southwest and into the northern, into the Great Basin helps, helps basically end the fire season for that southwestern corner of the United States. But what it does is that as that moisture streams northward through the Great Basin and into the northern Rockies in the northwest, uh, that, that m limited moisture tends to produce a lot of lightning. So uh, Another thing to consider, we have to see just the extent, the timing and the range of the monsoon this year and try to get a better feel for where uh, the potential for ignitions is going to be and how that relates to where the, the, the highest ignition probabilities in terms of the fuels are going to be. So right now our area of focus is obviously that northern, northern Great Basin into the Northwest, uh, particularly uh, into Oregon, uh, maybe up into parts of Washington uh, and into central Idaho, but um, again, there's still a lot of a lot of early summer to prepare those fuels uh, before we can be absolutely certain on where that's going to be. Uh, looking at the drought monitor, uh, th that just another tool that we look at. Uh, obviously, there's some drought there in southeastern Oregon, central Oregon, uh, an area of concern. Uh, but with the recent rainfall, uh, in terms of fire, they may still be in drought conditions, but uh, there's a potential that fuels will uh, benefit from that, that moisture recently. Uh, and so the drought, the whole idea that drought leads to fire uh, kind of breaks down in that situation just because of that, uh, uh, that relationship between precipitation and those desert fuel types. So uh, we'll continue to monitor that and see how things play out for that, that corner of the, of the Northwest. Uh, just quickly looking at fuels, uh, this is something that we look at, uh, the 100 hour and 1000 hour, the top two images, those are uh, measures of uh, the amount of moisture in dead fuels. And uh, these are fuels that respond to changes in moisture uh, uh, on the time scale of four days, which is 100 hours, and 40 days, which would be 1000 hours. And the reason why we keep track of this is because it's it's the dead fuels largely that will burn will carry a lot of the fire and the drier they are the more likely are that they they will be to burn and carry fire and so if you notice the red areas down in the southwest not unusual this time of year uh, to see that red down there uh, and if you look at the thousand hour fuels because they had a relatively uh, a relatively mild spring down there they didn't have a lot of extremes of heat, particularly New Mexico, Colorado, and eastern Arizona, uh, we're still seeing those uh, uh, not quite at the extreme levels. Farther west into western Arizona, into southern Nevada, you see the much drier conditions where they haven't had as much precipitation, uh, and they've seen some of the, the temperatures well above 100 degrees for, for several weeks now. Um, 
but not unusual, not something that really stands out and, and screams at you. Notice up in the Pacific Northwest in the thousand hour, still a lot of green up there. That means those larger dead fuels like small branches and logs, uh, they're still holding a lot of moisture because it takes uh, about 30 to 40 days for those larger fuels to lose their, their moisture as things as conditions dry out. Obviously in the Northern Rockies of Montana, Northern Idaho, where there's still a large, a large amount of snow up there, those larger fuels aren't gonna lose that moisture for quite some time as long as there's, there's uh, snow to melt and, and have uh, water for those uh, fuels to absorb. Uh, but we're gonna continue to monitor that. Uh, one thing that does indicate though is while we may see things like grasses and brush dry out in some of those areas in the Northern Rockies, um, it may not be dry enough in the larger fuels to sustain a lot of really, really hot, uh, large acre fires. Uh, that may not be true in Oregon uh, and parts of Washington where we're starting to see things dry out there a little bit more quickly now. And the lower image you saw, I already showed the, the vegetation drought response index. The lower left is the Keech Byram. That's just a measure of moisture, soil moisture. Uh, and you can see it still looks pretty wet across the Northwest, but the Keech Byram doesn't work really, really well in the Northwest just because the soils aren't uh, uh, the kind of soils that it was uh, set up for. Uh, but we still like to look at it just to kind of get a sense of, of uh, what all the different indices are showing. And that's one that we, we tend to look at fairly uh, frequently. Uh, give you an idea where we are right now with fire. The map shows where the current large incidents are uh, that are being reported. You see there's quite a bit of fire. Uh, a lot of that is in Alaska. Uh, if you look at Alaska, you almost can't see the map underneath because there's so many dots on there. Um, a lot of that fire, it's not unusual. Alaska does burn a lot every year. A lot of forests, a lot of black spruce forests up there that burn quite, quite regularly. Uh, and there's not a lot of concern up there. Their conditions are fairly wet. A lot of these fires are out in the wilderness uh, and they tend to not uh, try to put those out unless they're threatening villages or infrastructure. Uh, and so a lot of those are way out in the wilderness and not a big threat. And uh, fire is a natural part of the ecosystem. So as much as we can, we try to let fire do its natural uh, cleansing of the environment so that uh, we'll have healthier forests. And so those, for, those fires up there tend not to get a lot of attention unless they're threatening something important. But down, down uh, in the lower 48, you can see we're starting to see uh, more fire increasing along the West Coast, Northern California and, and uh, parts of Oregon. Uh, there was a big lightning outbreak last week, uh, very concentrated lightning that was very efficient. Uh, we had reports that uh, uh, a couple of storms produced 70 to 100 fires in just a matter of a couple of hours, small fires, mind you, but uh, uh, they were all fairly concentrated uh, and uh, they've been uh, uh, complex. And we do have a couple of teams across Oregon. On the right, you can see to date, as of this morning, We've had 682 fires in the Northwest for a total of about 45,000 acres so far. Uh, I, that, that's probably around normal. I don't have the year-to-date normals for, for the Northwest available, but that doesn't sound unusually high or low. Uh, if you also look at parts of the Great Basin, which includes uh, Idaho, most of Idaho, uh, they've only burned about 38,000, 39,000 acres. And of course, the Northern Rockies, which is primarily Montana, has only burned about 3,500 acres so far this year. And a lot of that was on the eastern parts in the dry plains uh, earlier this, this spring. So uh, for the Northwest, uh, somewhat slow start to the fire season. There's still plenty of fire season to go. The peak of those seasons up there uh, is usually around uh, late July into August and early September before things start to wind down. So there's still plenty of time uh, for the fire season to pick up. And it, and it certainly will. We'll start to see an increase in fire in the Pacific Northwest in the coming weeks as things really get, uh, as the heat really picks up uh, and we start getting into drier environments. And we start seeing uh, an increase in thunderstorm activity with lightning that can produce fires up there. Just to show you a, a closer view, this is uh, the, the fire activity across the north. Hi, excuse me, we're running into 
afternoon. If you could finish up in the next uh, few seconds, we have a couple of questions to get to. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, I, I, I got a couple, couple more slides. So it's just quickly, these are the fires that are there that they're actively monitoring. Uh, the yellow ones in the, uh, to the north are fires that are contained, meaning they've, they've, they've got a uh, line around them and there's not a lot of threat of those spreading. The ones in red are still active fires and they're still actively working on them, but they're not, they're not generating a lot, of, a, a lot of additional problems for them right now. Uh, so just a quick uh, summary. Uh, fire season obviously is going to continue to, to its, its normal progression from the southwest to the northwest and northern Rockies over the next few weeks. Uh, once we see that uh, moisture surge up with the uh, southwest monsoon, uh, we'll see that southwest fire risk drop down very quickly. But that, that uh, potential ignition source with those leading edge thunderstorms on that moisture plume will start moving up through the Great Basin into the northwest. So timing is everything. If those fuels stay fairly moist up there, uh, that lightning's not going to have a huge impact, but if we see a sudden drying trend, uh, particularly in those grass fuels of, of southern, southeastern and central Oregon, southwestern Idaho, and parts of uh, Washington, we could see uh, a lot of fire starts up there. And then as we get later in July, we start to see those offshore systems come in that bring lightning uh, off the Pacific, and that could light up some of those dry areas of western Oregon uh, and along the Cascades. Um, but we've so far we've had a relatively cool uh, start to the season and a lot of moisture up there, so we're we're seeing some short-term reduction in the fire risk, and then of course uh, uh, timing of of the drying conditions and the the uh, potential lightning uh, is going to really determine the amount of fire activity we have in the Pacific Northwest this this uh, this summer. So here's our current outlook. Uh, there's a lot of red on the map. We're getting ready to put out our new outlook on the first of the month. Uh, there'll probably be some changes up there, adjustments based on the current conditions, uh, but this is kind of where we're going right now. Uh, I think uh, we might see some changes to the outlook uh, for Montana and northern Idaho, just because the conditions up there are really wet, uh, but we'll have to see uh, what happens in the next few days and uh, uh, before we make that final determination. And that's all I have. Uh, I'll toss it back to you. All right, thank you, Ed. Uh, we've uh, unfortunately run out of time for questions, so I can ask one, and then we will follow up with the rest of the questions after the fact. Um, so the one question I'd like to highlight is uh, about the UW Water Watcher. So this is for uh, John and Bart. Um, this person said that they'd like to share the, the Water Watcher with the general public, but it was confusing to see uh, Seattle yellow on the drought classification, but neutral wet on the drought summary. Um, do you have any way to try to explain that to the general public when there's that difference in, um, in metrics? Yeah, so this is John. I would, I would just say that drought has a lot of different flavors and time scales. And so I, I think sort of like what Bart mentioned in terms of relatively wet conditions over the short term, seven days across the sort of eastern, wash, or sort of eastern Oregon, it uh, doesn't necessarily jive with longer term drought situations there. So it's useful to look at the different time scales and ask what aspect of drought are you interested in and what sort of impact of drought are you interested in. All right, thank you. And uh, that concludes our webinar today. And like I said, we will follow up with those questions that were asked on the question box. Um, so you'll hear from uh, me, Megan, or Britt uh, later on this week. Thank you all for joining and please join us um, next webinar in August.